Emerson. We're at a two-day countdown now for Thanksgiving, so later on the whole GME fam will be together for some turkey talk coming up. And music reporter Ali Reed is whipping work this episode. Good morning, Emerson. Bees in the Trap with the Trap Music Orchestra later in the show. All that and more today, Tuesday, November 24th. I'm Amelia Fabiano. And I'm Anthony Monzon. And here at GME, we're devoted to giving you some stuffing before <laughs> talking about uh, stocking stuffers. That's so right. <laughs> we're going to be sitting down with uh, cooking correspondent Lulu Romano and talking about a few things that you could do with your leftover cranberry sauce. Yes. So that's sure to be the a very fun The ultimate leftover. Time. And we also have an interview coming up with Mimi Warnick, who is the director of Godspell, some great young talent here. She's only a sophomore Absolutely. who's directing this full-blown production. So that'll be great to talk to her about as well. Absolutely. Well, first we have a headline story to get to, an update from uh, the Parisian situation at the moment. That's right. The world is still on high alert after the Paris terrorist attacks. We have the latest updates. Today marks the fourth straight day that the city of Brussels is shut down following terrorist threats. White House Press Secretary Josh Earnest discussed what President Obama thinks about the lockdown. Let's take a look. This is actually an area where we do believe that there is more that our European partners can do uh, in terms of improving the quality and quantity of information that they share with one another, but also improving the uh, amount of information and the way that information is shared with the United States. From schools and museums to government offices and public transportation, the city has been shut down. The threat of terrorist attacks similar to what happened in Paris have rocked the city since the beginning of the weekend. The threats are aligned with ISIS, and while they appear real, they are also unspecified, as authorities are not directly saying what is causing such extreme measures. But they are saying that it's real enough to warrant soldiers constantly in the streets, conduct raids, arrest suspicious people, and warn the public to avoid unnecessary travel. Authorities announced that the area would remain at a level four threat for the rest of the week, which is the highest possible. Residents described the situation as a very strange and eerie atmosphere and that the security measures have added the to the climate of fear. Meanwhile in Paris, a street cleaner Monday found an explosive vest similar to those used in the Paris attacks near the place where a fugitive suspect's cell phone was discovered. And it was found in the same area where a cell phone belonging to suspect Salah Abdeslam was pinpointed by GPS on the day of the Paris attacks. This leads to the possibility that he may have aborted his mission. Now, Sam Benson-Smith joins us in studio now. Um, we have some reports of a Turkey, uh, a Russian fighter jet that was shot down in Turkey. Sam, what can you tell us about that? Thanks, Amelia. Uh, recently, we have reports coming in that a Russian fighter jet was shot down on the Turkish-Syrian border. Both pilots ejected. Currently, their whereabouts are unknown, but sources have come showing videos that a rebel group in Syria has detained the Russian pilots. This comes as a further escalation of the Syrian conflict. Several weeks ago, NATO called out Russia for violating Turkish airspace. President Vladimir Putin is quoted as calling it a stab in the back for the Russian Federation from, the Tur uh, from, from Turkey. Um, it, currently, the, the aircraft it was shot down by a fighter jet, a, a Turkish fighter jet with an air-to-air -air missile. We, we still have uh, more details that are developing. But once again, as I mentioned, this is a further escalation in the already escalating Syrian conflict. And it's really over the next few days, the next few hours, it's really a huge question as to how Russia will respond moving forward, especially following the Paris attacks when you got the UK and France uh, escalating their airstrikes in Syria. It's kind of a very difficult situation and it's gonna be a lot of things that are gonna be developing in the next several hours and days. And now from the violence in Paris and on the Syrian border to a shooting near the French Quarter, the search is now on for suspects after multiple shooters began firing in New Orleans on Sunday. Sam, what's, uh, what's the latest on that story? Thanks, Anthony. Uh, following a shooting which injured 17 on Sunday, New Orleans police are currently involved in a manhunt for, uh, for a potential gunman. The shooting occurred in a Ninth Ward Park during an impromptu music video shoot following a local parade. It's estimated that up to 500 people were present in the park at the time of the shooting. All 17 victims are in stable condition. Yesterday, British Prime Minister David Cameron announced a need for greater efforts by the European Union to share intelligence and begin action against the Islamic State. This week, Cameron will lay out his plan to begin Royal Air Force strikes on ISIS targets in Syria. Two years ago, Cameron's proposal to begin strikes in Syria was shot down by Parliament. The UK is currently involved in aerial missions in Iraq. 
Yesterday, it was announced that drug titan Pfizer Incorporated would purchase Allergan PFC in a deal valued at $160 billion. The merger is currently drawing political criticism because the new company would avoid considerable taxation in the U.S. due to the new location of the company's headquarters in Dublin, Ireland. This move is known as a tax inversion. President Obama, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders have all publicly voiced their disapproval of the use of this tactic. And following a close election, Argentina has a new president, Mauricio Macri. Macri, the former mayor of Buenos Aires, defeated Daniel Scioli by three percentage points. Scioli was hand-selected uh, hand by current president Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. Ms. Kirchner served as president since 2007 and was preceded by her husband, Nestor Kirchner, who served from 2003 until 2007. The election stands as a huge victory for the conservative Republican P proposal party. And that's all I have for you today. Anthony and Amelia, back to you. Thanks, Sam. We'll have updates for you as they come in, of course. But the holiday season is certainly upon us. Medina Shahi now joins us to take a look at what we can expect the weather to look like for our holiday travels this week. Medina. Thanks, Anthony and Amelia. These upcoming days will be freezing for us, but at least it will be sunny and bright. Today, the high will be 44 degrees. Yesterday, the wind was high, but today it will slow down nicely. However, still take out those hat and gloves because the weather is chilly. Tonight, the temperature will decrease to the low of 31 degrees. It will be a nice, clear sky with increased humidity. Take advantage of a clear sky tonight because clouds are usually always there. Think of it as the perfect fall night where you can sip hot chocolate and stare at the stars. Tomorrow, we'll have similar weather. The high will be 45 degrees and the low will be 38 degrees. Sunny sky, mild wind, but cold temperatures describe a usual Bostonian fall day. At least the sunlight will somewhat wake you up from the dreadful cold. Throughout the week, the weather will get warmer. Thursday and Friday will have an increase in temperature with low 60s as the high and 40s as the low. Thursday and Friday will also be partly cloudy days. Isn't it weird that the warmer days contain clouds while the colder days contain sun? That's not my cup of tea, but whatever. Saturday will bring the temperature back to the high 40s and will bring along rain showers to this week. This week starts with the cold, then to the warm, to a cold rain. However, it will be nice and warm for Thanksgiving as well as Black Friday. So, get excited. I wish you all a happy Thanksgiving with like, your loved ones. <laughs> well, that's all I have for you today. Thanks for tuning in, and let's get back to Anthony and Amelia. Thanks, Medina, <laughs> so much. Now, when we come back, we'll be going from cold Thanksgiving temps to the plagues of Egypt. Godspell director Mimi Warnick will be sitting down with us to give us the details on her theatrical exploration of the Gospel of Matthew. Stick around. We're now joined by Mimi Warnick, the one and only. She is the director of Godspell. Mimi, how are you this morning? Hey, how are you guys? Very well. Thank now, you. Mimi, tell us a little bit about the plot of Godspell for those of us that are maybe a little bit less theatrically inclined. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, um, Godspell follows the general gospel of Matthew. Um, it follows parables and teachings of um, Jesus to his new following, what we consider the disciples. And then the second act takes a more closer look on the path leading up to the crucifixion and then eventually resurrection. Excellent. And you said it's not necessarily a religious yeah. play, though. What do you mean by that? Definitely. Um, well, Stephen Schwartz, who also wrote Wicked, um, who also wrote Godspell, did a revival in 2012 of the production and definitely changed things up a little bit mm -hmm. by adding more relevant content, gags, if you will. Kim Kardashian, Donald Trump all make appearances <laughs> throughout the production. So kind of just use more the lessons of the story as driving the plot rather than the actual parables and text itself. Okay. Great. Right. So the characters in the play aren't yes. necessarily just characters from the Bible, but right. maybe, again, some, some contemporary figures, as mm -hmm. you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And something that's really cool is all the characters are referred to their actual names. Um, okay. Everyone besides Jesus is just referred to their real life name. Okay, excellent. And what has the process been like for you in putting this together as a director? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're about week four now, so a six-week process. And it's been definitely really crazy. Um, I think we all didn't know how hard it was actually going to be to direct mm -hmm. because a lot of it's subtext and kind of just pushing that religious thing but not really making it religious. Right. Um, but our cast is so talented. Uh, my team with Zach Gautieri, music directing, Christina Recipe choreographing, who are also sophomores. So definitely we're taking a, our first plunge. but really amazing process so far. Excellent. Now this is your first time directing here at Emerson. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the maybe um, unexpected uh, hiccups along the way that, that you really didn't see coming in your first uh, time? 
Yes, yeah, so, so far at Emerson, I've really only been like a producer. So mm -hmm. taking the more creative route has definitely been a change. Uh, so just really making my decisions a decision that goes, and it's scary, but important. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, what, are, what are some of the challenges you faced, you know, being a first-time director and having this kind of be your first project to work on? Um, I think really making sure that my voice is the voice right. and kind of, it's student theater, so definitely um, respecting peers, but kind of just always keeping that relationship of actor versus director right. and keeping that line very clear. Okay. Now, Emerson has a huge acting community, so you must have had a very good amount of yeah. people to potentially cast. Yeah. How did you sort through all of those? What were some of the, the key elements to your casting decisions? Yeah, so at Common Odds this year, we had over 500 students, which was huge wow. for over six um, recognized uh, theater groups. And taking a cast of 10, it was incredibly difficult. But I was really looking forward not to people that maybe had the best talent right away off the bat, but really mm -hmm. that just showed their character and good vibes is what we were telling right. them. <laughs> right, excellent. And now, um, so what made you decide to get involved with directing? Is this something you've always wanted to kind of explore? And, and why did you choose Godspell as your first production mm -hmm. to, to do that with? Uh, well, directing and more of the production side is definitely something new at college. I was performance my entire life leading mm -hmm. up to Emerson. Um, but the reason I chose Godspell was because it was definitely one of the first shows that made me get involved in theater when I was very, very young. And it's just the kind of idea that I think the content is so socially relevant today while it's taking back text of the gospel and everything. When we're discovering each night in rehearsal how it connects to so many social issues and mm -hmm. things we are dealing with today. Right. So definitely choosing that was a huge thing. Now so. the performance is being done through MTS, that's Musical mm -hmm. Theater Society for all of you watching at home. <laughs> um, so what ha how can students get involved with MTS? Yeah, so um, MTS is one of the SGA groups on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, so just emailing, Facebook group, website, anything like that, you can directly get involved. Um, they have a board, an advisory board, so many different opportunities um, like that. Excellent, and, and where can students get tickets for this? Where mm -hmm. are the performances at, and when are the dates? Yeah, so tickets will go on sale December 4th okay. um, through the website or the Facebook. The link will be on either side, they're all online. Um, the performances are December 10th and 11th in the Billboardy. Okay. Absolutely. Excellent. All right, Mimi Warnick, thanks so much for That's being great. here. Now, we are getting to the dry season uh, with it being winter, but it is raining buckets in San Francisco as defending <laughs> NBA champs. Golden State have started their season 15-0. Sports reporter Sean Stackhouse has the latest. Sean? All right, thanks. thanks, Anthony. And in case you haven't heard, the Golden State Warriors are good. Like, really good. They are undefeated through their first 15 games of the season. And if they win one more, they will have the best start to a season in NBA history. Steph Curry is currently leading the league in scoring with over 32 points per game. And as a team, the Warriors lead the league in scoring. Some are comparing the Warriors to the 95-96 uh, Bulls, who went 72-10. However, the Warriors are off to an even better start. Tonight, the Warriors will take on the struggling Lakers. And if they win, they'll be the first team to ever start 16-0. And on to baseball, the Dodgers have found a replacement for Don Mattingly. Former Red Sox hero and 10-year MLB vet Dave Roberts will be the next Dodgers manager and the first minority manager in their history. Roberts, who is half African-American and half Japanese, said it's hard for him to put into words what it means to be the manager of the Dodgers, but that he will do his best to honor those who came before him. As a player, Roberts had a career average of 266 and a whopping 243 steals. And Ohio State has been dethroned. The reigning college football national champions lost to Michigan State on Saturday for their first loss since week two of 2014. Ohio State was ranked third overall, but expect to see them drop out of contention for the college football playoff. And there's still a chance they can make it to the Big Ten championship. However, they will need to beat Michigan State this week and have Michigan State lose to Penn State, which after last week I don't expect to happen. So, sorry Ohio State fans, a repeat of last year's national championship, very unlikely. But outside of college football, the NFL had another incredible week of action for all fans to enjoy. Unless your fantasy football team lost like my dad's did. In case, we here at GME are all thinking of you. But let's take a look at the top NFL plays of the week. Starting off with a thrilling play. Look at that major hit put on by Eric Reed to Doug Baldwin. Take a look at that again. Sent out of bounds, stopped at the goal line. Trick play by the Texans here. TJ Yates fires it over. Cecil Shorts hits Alfred Blue for the touchdown. Now our top play of the week, Aaron Rodgers. Fires, hits James Jones. Did he get it in? Let's take another look. He gets the toe touch to go in. Perfect play. 
what an incredible week. And again, the uh, Patriots were able to win last night. They beat the Bills on Monday Night Football. They stay undefeated. Now, Anthony and Amelia, back to you. Thanks, Sean. Now, music correspondent Allie Reed is here to wake you up with some one-of-a-kind tunes from the Trap Music Orchestra. Let's take a look. Hey guys, I'm Allie Reed giving you all the latest music updates in the Boston area. Today I'm here at Berklee College of Music where I'm going to be sitting down and speaking to some of the members of Trap Music Orchestra. So I'm here with the creator of Trap Music Orchestra, Ryan Easter. So tell me a little bit about why, why did you guys decide to start this group in the first place? Traditionally, um, what we are is kind of a trifecta of three different outlets of black music where you have most recently, you have trap music that's involved. Mm -hmm. uh, you have jazz in particular. You have it being derived from the big band swing era. And you also have orchestral music, such as um, I would say we're more late romantic era-esque than anything. The idea was to take a uh, very underappreciated culturally type of music, i.e. trap music, and really pump a lot of not necessarily worth, but to give it the attention it deserves, you have to kind of translate it into different languages. What is it like being in this band? Being in this band is wonderful. I love working with these guys. It's all guys that are all my friends. I've been hanging out with them for a long time. Everything always gels really fast. And, uh, the group dynamic is just so uh, cohesive. I couldn't be happier, honestly. I never thought I would be managing such a big band, even managing it all. I'm a vocalist first. Um, but I could not be happier. They're just the best group of people. We've become such close family and friends, and I could go to them for anything. And it's a lot of fun. It's just all we're trying to do is, you know, just have a good time and spend time together and create really good music. So I'm, it's, it's wonderful, honestly. Where do you see yourselves going from here? Right now, we're trying to take the, art, the artist route, uh, where this year we used it to really introduce people to what we do, get them comfortable with our setting, as difficult as that could be. Uh, we dropped a project earlier this year, it was an EP, uh, it had four, I would say they were trap music classics on there, but now we're going to really deliver everybody with our original music. Perfect. Well, I think that pretty much sums it up for this week's episode. Watching Trap Music Orchestra perform really made me get inspired to start my own music. So right now, I'm sitting in a sound booth, and I'm going to start practicing on my own music so one day I could be just as good as them. Until next time, I'm Ali Reed, giving you the latest feed, and I will see you real soon. Bye! Welcome back. It is turkey time here on GME. We have the whole family with us here right now. <laughs> Welcome, guys. So let's hear it. What are some of your family traditions for this, this Thursday? Ooh, ooh, who wants to? Uh, I'll have to take this one. So uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, my, my family, if you haven't been able to tell, you guys know me pretty well. We're a peculiar bunch. I've, uh, I've learned a lot. Yeah, no, go figure. Uh, my, my ability to like talk and banter with people comes from my family originally. We're very talkative. We're Scotch, Irish, Italian. Odd combination. I know I do not look Italian in the slightest. I'm about as pale as they come. But the reason why I've learned to talk and why I like to talk is because my family, every year, we pick a weird topic and we just kind of go off on it. Like in the past few years, for some reason, this sounds crazy. Once again, families are odd and stuff. We started talking about pellet stoves. There was a Twitter handle created for Pellet Stove Quarterly. And for some reason, we just kept on talking about it. And all the old, like, all the adult table would walk by. And mind you, I'm the youngest one at 20. So everybody's like 20 and up. All the adults are walking by like, why are the kids talking about pellet stoves? What's going on? We're I mean, like, why well, not? I mean, the R48, it's a very good year for that. It's a very solid pellet. But, um, you know, besides that, it's just a lot of talk, a lot of family, a lot of fun, and a lot of pellet stoves. My so. family That's loves great. to bring in Bosnian culture. Yeah. They don't want to be, like, American in a way, so yeah. they put turkey with Bosnian traditional food, oh, which okay. makes sense. Well, it tastes good, but it's weird. <laughs> so what kind of foods do you guys have? We have, a, um, it's called pizza, and it has like cheese or spinach wrapped in like, it looks like a pie, but it's a salty pie. Oh, and then there's like beef that. mixed in with it. It's very weird, but it tastes pretty yeah, good. I don't know about you guys, but the best part isn't necessarily the turkey and gravy and mashed potatoes. It what, it's what comes after with the dessert. Oh, oh that oh. pumpkin pie. Got pie of stuff. Bread. Uh, it's going to be the best dessert of the entire year. Nothing beats 
Thanksgiving dessert. Nothing right. beats That's just true. eating that pumpkin just pumpkin pie fall. mix out of the can. Oh. Just like oh. nom, nom. How, how we how we feeling about the turducken this year, huh, guys? Oh. Uh, the turducken. Well, controversial Ash bird. Or Ashley, birds. Ashley was telling me that her family actually go out to restaurants. Do yeah, they, we do. Do they do. put the duck in the turkey we at the put restaurant? In, we put in a special request to actually watch the ritual uh, happen. Yeah, it's great. The ritual of the it's turducken. The, the ritual yeah, of the, the turducken. It's, it's a new tr it's a new trend. Myth. The Lachon family likes to keep up with what's hip and happening. So of course we. Uh, <laughs> We do that, but I don't eat meat, so it doesn't is, bother me. Yeah. <laughs> the things culinary professionals have to do nowadays. She's uh, more of a tofurkey person. That's a tofurkey. All right, that's a, that's, a, that's another new one for me. So we'll uh, we'll have to see about that. Now, in terms of turkey bowl positions, Ooh, I mean, turkey, oh. bowl, turkey bowl, great bowl. American tradition. Yes. I'm a phenomenal uh, cheerleader. I must <laughs> say, I, uh, I, I'm very good at eating all the cornbread that's present. Also, getting concussed by my two older brothers. Thanks, <laughs> I appreciate it. No, but it's. It's always so much fun. Last year we were in New Jersey with about three foot of feet of snow. I was just running around, catching a football, playing some a little bit of pig skin, a little bit mm. of fun. And, and Anthony, you said you play soccer, right? Yeah, yeah. We we our, our uh, turkey bowl's a little bit uh, more more fusion themed, uh, <laughs> a little Latin fusion, and uh, so yeah, we do we do a uh, turkey football, but uh, football, you know that whole thing. No, um, so no it's, right? It's definitely definitely uh, the American dream, as they say, as right? They that's uh, that's what they say. Either way, we'll uh, put a little little halt to this. Uh, we're gonna take a quick commercial break. But, uh, but when we come back, uh, we'll be having plenty of leftovers. <laughs> we'll actually be cook uh, with cooking correspondent Lulu Romano with some cranberry craziness. That's right, I said cranberry craziness. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gents. Thanks for waking up with us. Now, if you missed the American Music Awards this weekend, the lovely Ashley Lachance got you covered. Ashley, take it away. Of course, darlings, I've got you covered. All eyes and ears were on Sunday night's American Music Awards, and let me tell you, the performances absolutely outweighed the actual awards. Triple Threat Jennifer Lopez hosted, opening the show in an insane dance tribute to the hottest songs of the year. There were performances by The Weeknd, One Direction, Selena Gomez, Nick Jonas, Demi Lovato sang with Alanis Morissette, Justin Bieber danced in the rain, and Megan Trainor snogged Charlie Puth's face off. As a finale, Celine Dion brought the audience to their feet with an evocative tribute to Paris. It was wonderful. This weekend marked the end of the Hunger Games franchise as the final film in the series, Mockingjay Part 2, opened in theaters. In this installment, Katniss sets off on an adventure from District 13 to the Capitol, bringing along familiar faces Gale, Peeta, and more to assassinate all-around bad guy President Snow. The movie brings great closure for all sorts of fans and made $101 million its opening weekend, which was surprisingly the lowest opening weekend out of all of the Hunger Games movies. But that didn't stop the series from going out with a bang in this entertaining flick. And just in time for the holidays, SNL presented us with an absolutely hilarious homage to Adele's latest hit and our new favorite song, Hello. In a Thanksgiving-themed sketch, SNL players cut between uncomfortable family chatter at the dining dinner table and singing their hearts out to Adele's song. The magic of Adele brings these strongly opinionated adults together, and as the video progresses, so does the hilarity. Think long blonde wigs, tears, fake nails, and fur coats on everyone, Matthew McConaughey included. Prepare for a brand new must binge online series featuring a totally badass superhero, and her name is Jessica Jones. Available exclusively on Netflix and streaming as of November 20th, the series is being marketed as a superhero show for adults, following Kristen Ritter as the sarcastic title character, a secret agent with superpowers. Featuring former Doctor Who David Tennant and set in New York City, what could possibly go wrong? Aside from the conflict in the show, of course, because, you know, superheroes need to undo wrongs. All right, you know what I mean. Anyway, wishing you all a happy Thanksgiving. Now, back to Anthony and Amelia. Thanks, Ashley. Now, why go to the theater when you can have the Hunger Games at home? <laughs> and this morning here on GME, we're with cooking correspondent Lulu Romano. And Lulu, what do you have for us uh, for your Thanksgiving feast, or leftover feast, yes, I should say? Right. Yes, <laughs> so today we're going to learn how to make some cranberry sauce pancakes. So after Thanksgiving, there is sure going to be a lot of uh, leftover cranberry sauce. Always of course. is. <laughs> yes. And what I like to do is kind of making like a, a sticky, thick syrup with the leftover cranberry sauce I have. So one right. way to do it is to add some uh, honey to it. Right. Okay. 
love the bottle. That bottle <laughs> is like all time faves, American classic. <laughs> That's True. right. And this kind of makes it almost like a syrup also yes, for the pancakes. Exactly. So. Because it's kind of like mimicking the syrup, but the you know, the regular syrup but with the right. zest. Right. Do you mind if I try stirring it? I'll do a little, oh, a little absolutely. demonstration for everybody. Look here. at this. Look at this lusciousness of this cranberry and sauce. And beautiful color. While you stir, Anthony, we're gonna add a couple of grapes. These okay. are seedless grapes, therefore, you know, when you kind of eat it, it's not, never gonna be like, you have to spit out the right. grapes. Right, exactly. don't want that. So should I just stir this in here? Yes, please. You can, look, you can't even, can't even see the no. grapes. Incredible, it's just it's a it movie magic, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, all right, so when do, how long should I be stirring this for? 10 to 15 seconds. Okay, oh, careful. So, all right, so I think, I think we're okay then. Yes, thank you, Anthony. <laughs> yeah. So now we have the uh, syrup. So okay. here's a pancake, and the difference between this and the regular pancake is that it's made with some cranberry sauce filling. So it's kind of already like a foundation for our syrup. Right, and now what kind of batter did you use for these pancakes? Was it homemade? Did you do it from scratch? Well, don't worry, I mean, hate to, hate to put you on the spotlight like this, but uh, homemade or did you use Bisquick? I'm uh, gonna confess, it's not homemade. It is uh, from, okay. I think, Auntie Jane or Auntie Annie, one of those Auntie, yeah. <laughs> one of those Auntie mixes, and uh, so it's one cup of flour and one cup of water, and then uh, mix it evenly, pour into the pan, add my cranberry sauce, and there we go. Excellent. And you know, obviously, we're using leftovers here for cranberry sauce, but if for some reason there is no cranberry sauce left in that fridge, <laughs> where can our viewers find this in the grocery store for those of us that haven't yeah, purchased cranberry sauce? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the good thing about this is the e easy accessibility to this. So you can get it from CVS, your local drugstore, your uh, local supermarket, Stars, um, Shars, Whole Foods, any one of those, you're set. Right. Excellent. Now, okay, so from top to finish, mm -hmm. how long does this take to make? What's Lulu's estimated cooking time? Okay, so the ETA, I would say, is <laughs> anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. Tops. Oh, wow. Wow. Exactly. That's a pretty good uh, ETA to EAT, <laughs> huh? <laughs> very good. Very good, yes. And the thing is, if you want to kind of even cut it down even a little bit more, mm -hmm. what you can do, Amelia, is to kind of uh, do an, e an easier route. Instead okay. of making a pancake, just Get a nice yogurt, whatever flavor you want. We here we have coconut cream, mm, and then we awesome. add some of our special cranberry sauce. Here's a grape in it. Bam. Ooh, and what and other it's flavors? Almost, almost like a parfait, uh, and, and yeah. it looks pretty good. And then just so there, you you almost kind of stir it in, and uh, bam, you're good to go. Gotta <laughs> love it. Exactly. But Lulu, that's uh, all the time we have for you this week, and and for us as well. Uh, make that's sure to right. follow us online on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We're on all of it. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next Tuesday morning only on the Emerson Channel. Have a fabulous Thanksgiving. <laughs>